Hi everybody, this is Gary Novosil with Raw Dog Hawaii. Thank you for joining us for our local Hawaii Pet Professionals Week. I'd like to thank anybody who's joining us from outside the state of Hawaii. Aloha. And I'm going to do my best to answer not only the questions you may have about raw food, but any questions that come in. And if I miss any of those questions, I will follow up those after our Facebook Live event. So thanks for joining us. There are other presentations that are coming after mine. Uh, we have uh, Leader Linda Holm from uh, Makai uh, Pet Grooming and Pet Sitting. She'll be coming up at 1 o'clock, and I encourage you to go listen to her presentation. All right, so one of the big questions we get asked, and often a point of education we need to make, is why raw food? A lot, of feed, a lot of people feed kibble, and kibble is kind of the new normal. People think raw is some kind of uh, new fat. Well, 1.8 million species on the planet eat raw food, and only one species eats cooked food, and that's humans. So if we look out around the world and evaluate what every other animal eats, it's raw food. None of them have the capability to make fire. So they can't cook food and they certainly can't go to a grocery store to buy a bag of food. So what is an animal to do in the wild? Well, what we would find is that they would hunt for their food and they would generally consume every bit of that prey animal. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you how to make your own raw food at home and some of the ingredients that you can use and some I would recommend avoiding. But I want to talk a little bit, um, this is the only science I think I'm really going to get to and then we'll go right back to raw dog food. But it's a slight difference between humans and dogs and cats. We have an enzyme that converts a starch like flour or rice, sweet potatoes, oatmeal, barley, corn into sugar. And then sugar is what our body processes as energy. And if we don't need that extra sugar, that extra energy in our body, it gets deposited as fat. Um, different places around the body uh, and it's meant to be a survival mechanism. So dogs don't have that enzyme in their saliva. One of the reasons why is their bodies produce their own sugars from fat. They specifically have three enzymes that their body creates to produce sugars as they need it from stored fat. So a dog in the wild would never come across sugar unless it was in a prey animal that they were eating. So sugar is not a necessary component in pet foods. Now, when I compare the price of rice to the price of an organic, free-range, pastured, uh, non-GMO chicken, rice is obviously the better deal. The reason that that's important is because if I'm making a dry food, I have to comply with certain standards set aside by the American Association of Feed Control Officers. Let me show you one thing that you'll notice on a label of pet food that are an important differentiator for you when you're buying food. Get this a little closer. And you're going to see this phrase that says complete and balanced, okay? Complete and balanced is an important phrase, uh, and it's actually a defined phrase by the FDA. And what it means is this food has been nutritionally tested, all the amino acids, all the fats, all the vitamin content, the mineral content, and has been proven to meet the nutritional requirements of dogs. Our food happens to meet the requirements of cats, uh, but we only manufacture food for dogs. So 
without that complete balance on the front of a label or a box of food, you don't really know if that food truly is complete and balanced. So here's why. When I make a kibble, I wind up with this little dried nugget. And if I look at the list of ingredients on a bag, what I'm going to see are things like rice, uh, wheat flour, oatmeal, sweet potatoes, barley, things that are starches. Those are cheap. The organic chicken or any meat in general is very expensive compared to these things. So if I'm running a mass food business for pet food, I want to make as much profit as they can on the food while still meeting that complete and balanced on the label. So we do that by adding vegetables, uh, proteins and fats, organ meat from the animals, and some minerals and coconut fat in the form of organic coconut oil. And we then have our food nutritionally tested to make sure that we are meeting those standards. The way the dry dog manufacturers do it is they will add the minerals and the vitamins back to the food because they cook it at 800 degrees. They've killed everything in it. And now they have to add those things back to make it complete and balanced for a dog. So if you look at the list of ingredients on a raw food, or a, a very good kibble, that list is going to be pretty short. On a lower quality food, that list is going to be pretty long, and you probably won't even be able to pronounce most of the words in it. So, simple list of ingredients is better. Less or no starches is highly desirable. Uh, dog allergies are actually produced because the dog eats starch. It never turns to a sugar, it ferments in their stomach acid, and then it winds up coming out with their pores and through their sweat glands. So that fermented starch causes the skin allergies, the ear fungal infections, hot spots, shedding, stinky poop, gas, uh, even the thing that we call dandruff on, on a dog's rear is actually starch flakes. Dogs don't sweat through their skin like we do, so dogs are incapable of producing dandruff. So that's the one bit of science. The other, and this is a quickie, a lot of people feed their dogs carrots. And carrots are not harmful to a dog at all. Uh, this is a lacinato kale leaf, and we use this and four or five other different green vegetables as a source of vitamins and minerals in our food. But if I take this, or I take this, and I give this to my dog. Dogs lack an enzyme called cellulase. So as a human, I can fully digest this carrot. I can get the vitamin C and the beta carotene out of it, and my body can process the remainder as fiber. That's because I have that enzyme cellulase. If I give this to my dog, he may crunch it up a little bit into smaller pieces, but this is going to wind up coming out in his stool, um, however small he crunched it. It is no harm to a dog, but it is of no benefit whatsoever. So people ask us, well, my dog likes carrots. I say, well, if your dog likes carrots, give your dog carrots. It's not going to hurt your dog but it's not providing anything other than some fiber, if it's even providing that. So we used to micro grind carrots when we first started, and dog stools were coming out. They would turn white, and we see these little orange dots inside the food. So we knew that they weren't being digested at all. So that's one tip. The other, and, and this leaf, of course, it has plant fiber, so it's cellulase. If I can't mash a food raw with a fork and do any damage to that at all, your dog can't digest it. It's simply going to pass through as fiber. So again, not going to harm your dog, but not going to benefit your dog. Now, if I take something like 
a banana. This is interesting because part of it is digestible to a dog and the other part isn't. So if I take the plant fiber away, the skin, off of this banana, and I try to mash the skin, absolutely nothing's happened to that skin. So this would pass straight through a dog. However, if I take the banana, I'm able to pretty easily mash it with a fork. So this, the banana flesh itself, would be fully digestible by a dog. So potassium in bananas, some other vitamins and minerals that are in there. Here's another item that a dog can digest. This is an avocado. Um, we know that we can make things like guacamole out of it, but I can mash it. So that's also completely safe and beneficial for a dog. It provides a lot of essential fats for a dog. Now, there was a, a rumor going around several years ago that avocados were poisonous to dogs. First, there was never a study that did that and, and looked at that. What they looked at were goats eating avocado leaves, and they found that the leaves for the species of goat happen to be poisonous in massive quantities. So it has nothing to do with dogs or cats. If your dog likes avocados that fall from a tree, that's probably some of the best fat that they can get in their diet. And then what they need, they will convert to sugars so they can play in the park all day. All right, so let's get our starches out of here because we're not gonna put those in our food. And I'm gonna clean off my cutting board just a little bit. All right, so now we're gonna talk about whole prey diets and uh, what makes up uh, a whole prey diet. Whole prey is exactly what the name describes. It is the entire animal killed and eaten by a predator. So if we think about that, well, that may be gross to us. Dogs are hunters. They're scavenging carnivores. So they will hunt, they will kill, they will eat. Or if you've ever taken your dog on a walk and they've grabbed something on the side of the sidewalk and swallowed it before you ever have a chance to see what it is, they're perfectly fine. Whatever it was, if it was a cow bee bone or somebody threw out a, a chicken leg, um, it could have been out there for a month. Dogs' digestive systems are so acidic and so short that things like E. coli and salmonella don't have time to colonize and cause harm to the dog if they survive the stomach acid in a dog. Stomach acid in a dog is about a pH of one, and that will literally kill just about anything that is harmful to a dog. All right, so I want to make my food at home. And I'm going to say, I have a 40 pound dog. So how much do I feed my dog? And of what? What does my dog need? So this is an organic chicken. This is from Mary's Farm in California. These are humanely raised, no antibiotics. They're also never fed corn or soy. So if your vet has told you that your dog is allergic to beef or chicken, What's probably occurring is the animal that your dog is eating, that chicken, was fed corn. It was fed a starch. So that starch will build up in the muscle tissue of the animal. So when the dog consumes it, the digestive system still doesn't know what to do with starch. So you still have gas, you still have dog allergies, and it doesn't take very much starch at all. Uh, a quarter teaspoon of white flour is enough to cause these reactions, sometime um, almost violently in dogs. We'll see a dog going from completely normal to a rash-filled body in a couple hours. Um, most dogs can handle it better than that, but we have had a few dogs that have gone to that extreme. We've changed them to beef, the problems immediately go away. So, so if I'm going to feed uh, a 40-pound dog, 
I need to provide my dog one cup of food per day. Now, I know that doesn't look like much, but think about what we're doing here. All right? We are providing the protein and the fat and then some of the vitamins and minerals from our vegetables and our additives that your dog can digest. If I start mixing rice with it, then rice is a filler. It's going to substitute for some of that protein and fat. If I do that, I make the cost of my food cheaper. I also reduce the digestibility of my food. Those dogs can't digest this. But you know, we give our dogs a choice. We put down a food bowl and we say, there's dinner. People have told me my dog is finicky, my dog is picky, um, my dog will eat a little bit and walk away, I can leave the food down all day. Well, a polite dog in a pack starves to death. So when dogs eat, they don't really savor the flavor. They pick it up and they swallow it. Hence the phrase, my dog inhaled the food. And that's actually what they're supposed to do, because if dogs are competing for a prey animal, um, the polite dog starves to death and everybody else gets to eat. So I'm not going to be making kibble today. We're, we're going to be making a raw dog food. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a whole chicken. And, and you can buy parts just as easily. But what I'm going to want is I want the bones that are in the chicken because the bone content provides calcium, phosphorus, uh, other minerals that are important to a dog. So I would take this and I would throw this out into my yard for my dog. Now, the weight of this is about... Uh, three and a half to four ounces. Um, when I look at the volume of my cup, I know I need a little bit more. But one cup is what my dog is going to eat in a day. So I don't need to feed as much raw food as I feed kibble. If you're feeding kibble now, you see that when your dog goes to the bathroom outside, the stool is fairly large. And that's because that's what your dog can't digest, so that's what's exiting their system. When you feed the dog raw food, the amount of stool is relatively small. It's the fat that your dog didn't need to make sugars, and it's also some of the minerals like calcium or phosphorus or magnesium that your dog simply didn't need at the time, and it didn't need to store it. So in terms of percentages, our food, based on animal feeding trials, has shown it to be 96% digestible. The best kibbles on the market, um, Akana, Solid Gold, Origin, Primal, and I'm talking about Primal Kibble, not Primal Raw, um, those are on average about 43% digestible, or you'll hear the term bioavailable, to the dog. So, and my dog, Kua, is right down here because he smells the food up here. So if he barks, I apologize. He's deaf. He can't hear me. But he certainly has a keen sense of smell. So what I would do is I'm going to prepare uh, my 40-pound dog's worth of food for the day. Uh, I'm going to take um, a chicken leg. And I would break down this whole chicken because I'm not just going to make one meal in the morning and one meal at night. I would then take the vegetables, and here, let me show you what we're using. Uh, we're actually using the carrot tops, because the carrot tops contain beta carotene, they contain vitamin C. These are the part that humans throw away, and these are the part that humans need to be eating. This is lacinato, or dinosaur kale, um, very fibrous, but um, it kind of has a neutral taste to the dog. We actually take these and we juice them. Juicing it 
uh, especially juicing it cold, gives us all of the vitamins that we need from the vegetable in a liquid form. And we just add a little bit of that to our dog's food. Supplements that we add, we add organic kelp powder. That is specifically for the mineral content that's in the kelp powder. Uh, some calcium is magnesium, magnesium phosphate. And, and if you look up AFCO, A-A-F-C-O, and you look up nutritional requirements for dogs, you'll see some fairly complicated nutritional lists, like the ratios of calcium to phosphorus, why that's important. Omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratios, why that's important. And what happens if you go out of those boundaries? Um, too much calcium. Well, that'll least, that will leach phosphate from bone and cause bones to become brittle. So we need to make sure that when we do our formulations, we specifically take that into account as we're making it. Now, how much organ meat versus how much protein and how much fat compared to the amount of bone. So let's look at this chicken leg. I've already put in the, the vitamin mixture. And you'll see that about 80, maybe 85%, somewhere in that range, is protein and fat. Uh, the protein is usually around 85%. The balance is going to be fat, and I'm just talking about the, the protein-fat ratio, not the ratio of the whole thing. You're going to get about 10% bone, and that is animal-dependent. On a chicken, it's slightly higher. On a cow, it would be slightly less. And then I'm also going to get about 6% chicken. It's about 5% of organ meat. So what I have here, let me find one, there it is. So I've got beef gizzard, beef liver, and a separated, but a beef heart. So this is what would come in a chicken. So knowing that my dog over a few days is going to eat that chicken, I would, you know, chop this up into smaller pieces, and then I would take a little bit of that, and I would add it to my dog's meal. Separate a little bit more, and I would add that for my dog's meal tonight. Um, let's see. I think I've covered um, most of what you need um, to, to make your food. So it's um, raw bone not cooked bone. And let me explain that because I do get a lot of people asking me, aren't chicken bones dangerous? Aren't beef bones dangerous? Um, you know, I've been told that my dog can choke on those things. You know, I don't have a cooked bone here to compare it to, uh, but this apple, I mean this uh, carrot uh, is, is kind of a good representation. I'll use the thinner one just so it's, it's easier. So at some point, this breaks as I bend it. And you'll notice there aren't any sharp edges to it. And part of the reason for that is one, it's fibrous, so it's designed to be that way. But second is, it has an extremely high moisture content. So the majority of what makes up a carrot is water. When I compare a raw bone to a cooked bone, when I cook it, I am forcing moisture from the bone and quite literally drying out the bone. And when I eat my chicken, I don't want to see any bright red next to the bone of a chicken because that tells me the chicken's undercooked. But what it would tell me as a raw dog food manufacturer is now that I've dried out that piece of chicken, it will shatter or splinter. So when I break it, just like a wishbone in a Thanksgiving turkey, it will splinter and it will create sharp pieces. Whereas with a raw chicken leg, 
I mean, that carrot was much smaller. But there's no way for me to break that leg. If this leg was cooked, I could very easily snap. So for what that means for your dog is, as your dog is eating this, they clamp down and they turn their head to the side. They, they grind. They can't move their lower jaw from side to side, so they're really not capable of chewing like we are or like cows are. So they will clamp down and they will grind and literally they'll be grinding small bits and pieces of it off. And when they do bite through it, it's a clean break, just like the carrot. Um, this is true for duck bones or turkey bones or any type of bones. bones. If you're giving a choice to the dog and you're making the choice, you give it to them raw. That's exactly how they eat in the wild. That's exactly how a raw fed dog would eat. Um, okay, so let's make this, um, or let's turn this into a discussion about pre-made foods. Um, I'm gonna rinse my hands real quick. You should be able to see me. Um, pre-made foods exist all over the United States. They, you know, we have a couple raw providers here in Hawaii. And one of the things about Raw Dog Hawaii that's most important to me is that we support local. We know who our farmers are. We know how they raise their cattle. We know all of our ranchers, we know the slaughterhouses, we know how they work, we know if they've ever been shut down, we know their kids, we know their dogs, so we have a relationship with them and we want to help keep them in business. For us it's about supporting local and that's one of the reasons we're, we're doing these segments today is how do you support local businesses. So when you're feeding raw my dog, for example, he weighs 80 pounds, and an 80 pound dog is going to eat one pound of food per day. Now, these happen to be our chicken and beef blend. They're frozen solid. When I feed my dog, I literally will roll this out in the yard, and he's right there. I will roll this out in the yard, completely frozen, and that's how he likes to eat it. So that is breakfast, that is dinner, and that is all you have to feed an 80 pound dog. So if my dog is 40 pounds, one 8 ounce patty will feed a 40 pound dog for a day. So how do I do that? Well, I thaw this in half or I thaw this, I cut it in half, and I feed half in the morning and half at night. Now, people have also asked, how many times a day should I feed my dog? Dogs in the wild eat about every two to three days. Dogs who've been domesticated, we've taught them that they eat usually twice a day, sometimes two or three times a day. This won't end until he gets some food. So, um, he loves his raw food. If you have a smaller dog, you can thaw this patty. You can take it out of the freezer. Each of these boxes has four stacks of these patties, or 16 of them in a box. That's eight pounds. Um, for a 40 pound dog, that is 16 days worth of food. When you look in here, you're going to see some small specks. And let me bring that closer to you. If you look right here, you'll see that there are some small, can't quite see it on that side, but you do see it on that side. The reason that you see those specks is because when we juice our vegetables, we're left with this, and we're left with the dry pulp 
from all of our vegetables. So why do we put the pulp in? In the wild, on a full prey diet, if a dog were to, or any, any carnivore, were to eat a, or kill uh, something that's fur-bearing, let's say a cow, they would eat the hooves, the fur, uh, all of the organ meat, they would even eat the majority of the bones. The fur acts as the fiber. He is just not going to let up. Too many smells here for him. For a chicken, it is the feathers. The feathers act as the fiber. Fiber is important because that prevents constipation. Uh, Physillium husks, that's a great source of fiber. So if you're doing, it th doing this at home, you're not going to get a chicken with a whole bunch of feathers with it that you can put in your dog's food. So I can put Physillium husks. I can use a powdered, um, some sort of powdered fiber like a Metamucil or something like that. I can use, you know, ripped up plants. I can use shredded carrots. Um, all of those things can be used as a fiber source for the dog. Give me just a second because I'm going to keep him busy with one of these little discs. And I'm going to roll it outside for him. And he's going to be content for all of about two minutes while he crushes that and swallows it. So I've got at least two more minutes with you. Um, small dogs. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm feeding a small dog, what are my options? Well, one option is to grind your own food. And, and this is true with big dogs as well. You know, if I'm, if I'm making a batch of food for 30 days, um, one way is certainly I can portion my food every couple days. Uh, the other is a grinder. This, this happens to be a one horsepower Weston grinder, and you can find this on Amazon and, and other places. Uh, they make a three quarter horsepower model but that's not enough to guarantee that you're going to grind or, or break down all of those bones. So the one horsepower grinder I think now runs about $650, but it makes uh, really quick work of taking a chicken or chicken parts and turning it into ground chicken. You can also use it to make sausages, it comes with some other attachments. Uh, and it's the same for vegetables, although this is not as efficient as a juicing machine at all. Um, I could take these and grind them up. You're going to get a, a small percentage of, of the juice out of it, um, probably about 10% of what you would get out of a juicing machine. Uh, but you're still going to have a lot of plant fiber that can go back in the food. So that's an alternative. Um, Going back to the small dogs, we also make these small nuggets. And the formula is the same. Uh, we don't vary the formula between our 8 ounce patties, our 3 pound bag of nuggets, or our 5 pound bulk hamburger rolls or our bulk chicken rolls. Uh, it's the same, it's just um, this takes us the longest to make. Uh, the patties are the next longer, less resource dependent, and the chubs we can make pretty quickly. And we reflect those price discounts on our website and with our retailers. Um, can I feed it frozen? Absolutely. Uh, can I leave it at room temperature and warm it up? Yes. How long can this last in the freezer? Uh, frozen, probably about a year. But if you have a bag of dog food in your freezer for a year, that means you're probably not feeding it to your dog. So you've got to question why you keep it that long. Now, in the refrigerator, this is just like any other real food product. If I take this chicken and I put this chicken in my refrigerator, 
it's probably going to last me about four days. At the end of the fourth day, maybe the fifth day, depending on the temperature of my refrigerator, it's going to start to smell. And that means that it's rotting or it's going bad. Same thing with my nuggets, same thing with fresh vegetables. What confused me when I started manufacturing raw food is how can anybody that's feeding their dog kibble not think for a second that I can take a bag of kibble, I can put it out in my garage or on my lanai or in another container, I can leave it there for three, four months until I'm done with it, it looks the same, it smells the same, and it has not rotted. It hasn't gone bad. Well, real food rots. We, we know that. Real food spoils. Uh, leave um, a papaya on your counter for three weeks and see, see how palatable that is for you. It, it's, it's just, there are so many preservatives and so many fat stabilizers in kibble and, and again, you're literally forcing your dog to eat it. You're giving them a choice. You're putting food down on the floor and you're saying that's your food. That would be like my grandmother putting fried liver and onions in front of me and saying that's your dinner. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to eat liver and onions. Don't like it, don't like the taste, too strong for me. If she just left it there, uh, at some point, I would have to eat it for nourishment. I obviously wouldn't enjoy eating it. I might pick a little bit, you know, come back later, um, hope it's gone and replaced with something else. But if it's not, that's, my, that's you know, my grandmother's choice. You know, six years old, I'm not old enough to go out and drive, you know, get convenience food. But that's literally what we're giving our dog, is we're giving our dog convenience food that isn't fully nutritional for them. Uh, it's about 43% at best bioavailable. Uh, some of the worst are only 13% digestible. The rest wind up in your backyard as their stool. And I, I, I think it comes down to understanding dog behavior and realizing that something's wrong when it looks wrong. If I feed my dog something from the kitchen, like a piece of cheese, now my dog's deaf. He, he can't hear fireworks, which is awesome. But if I open a cheese package in the refrigerator, I, I do not know how he knows, but he is right there to get a piece of cheese. Normally, he would never bug me when I'm in the kitchen prepping, but I have every bit of his favorite food right here, and he smells it all. Uh, when I gave him that chicken heart, it was a swallow. It wasn't a chew. It wasn't a savor. savor. Uh, it was just gone. Uh, that patty that I gave him was gone in a minute and a half, and he is now quietly sitting out on the porch because he's full. So, raw food versus kibble. Again, I'm going to show you uh, the list of what you should find on a good food, or I should say a healthy food that has the potential to spoil. Organic chicken, grass-fed beef, our beef is either from Maui, uh, we get some from Kauai, we also have ranchers on the Big Island. Uh, beef organs coming from the same animal, organic chicken organs coming from the same chicken, uh, green beef tripe, which I haven't talked about yet, seasonal organic vegetables, and we do rotate our vegetables because not everything is always uh, fresh and available to us. So we have computer software that lets us model when we do a vegetable substitution, are we exacting or coming really close to providing the same nutritional content. So we know, for example, that when Swiss chard goes out of season, uh, we have to use curly leaf kale instead of the lacinato or the dinosaur kale. 
and we need to add carrot tops to it um, in order to get that same balanced nutritional profile. Um, the other things we add, organic kelp powder, organic milk thistle, and organic coconut oil. The milk thistle uh, providing minerals, certainly, but it also helps repair liver damage that is done by the heavy additives and heavy metals that are in dry dog food or other sources like treats that they may get. Um, and the ingredients on this are, are almost identical. It's a different blend, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bore you and read it to you. But green tripe. Now, green tripe. Uh, first of all, tripe is the the stomach of the prey animal. You can see here that this. Sorry. You can see here that this has been conveniently cut into uh, one ounce slices. There are 16 in this package. And this is frozen solid and for a very good reason. Tripe, or the cow's stomach, well, any herbivore stomach, like even, even a deer or a cow, uh, contains probiotics, digestive enzymes, and broken down grass or leaf matter. So chlorophyll. We remove the grass out of the first stomach, and yes, we get the whole animal, so uh, we know what those animals have been eating. We know if an animal has been fed corn when a rancher has told us they haven't, and we'll reject that animal. But most of the time, we see what's called green tripe uh, because of the chlorophyll that's in the grass, or black tripe. And it really depends on the time of the year, um, but tripe, let me get my other knife here, there's a chicken knife and a chicken cutting board and other knife and everything else knife. My hands are a little damp, so Kua likes these a lot. He begs for them. Now, this is frozen solid. And what you're going to see is the cow stomach that's been completely ground up. The white specks are fat or part of the stomach lining. So it's really difficult to tell whether this little white dot is fat or whether it's the tripe you see in pho or other you know, regional dishes. The green, or a lot of the darker parts, are further into the cow's stomach. So the further it goes through the digestive process, the darker it gets. The, the green grass, the chlorophyll, is towards the front uh, of the stomach, and then as you move back, it starts to get darker because digestive enzymes uh, are, are working to break it down into something usable. Uh, by the cow. So this is simply ground. We take it and fill uh, very long two inch diameter tubes with this and then we painstakingly bandsaw this into these one inch or I'm sorry one ounce discs. So why frozen? Now I'm used to this smell but I can tell you that it is uh, not a pleasant smell. And being frozen solid, um, it, still st it still stinks. But it is one of the most beneficial things that I can give a dog. So knowing that they need to get it and knowing that I need to handle it, rather than cutting it up in my kitchen and grossing out my entire family, I just take out a disc and I drop it into his food. That is going to thaw in probably 10 minutes max, it'll turn into a mush. If I gave it to him right now, it would be just like his frozen dinner that he just got. He's actually going to get this. Um, and I can, at the end of the video, I've got just a couple more minutes, I can show you what that's going to look like. Now, now, he's already eaten 8 ounces of food. He weighs 80 pounds. 
Uh, but I guarantee you this is not going to last long. So we put this back in the freezer so it doesn't melt on us. And I apologize, I'm the only one running um, this today. So I am going to uh, try to go back and see if I have any other questions. Okay. Thank you for saying it's the best dog food in the land. I appreciate that. I guess I should have wiped my hands just a little better, but that's okay. Okay, so um, Donna Pacheco asked the question, I put my dog on raw duck Hawaii food a while ago. It's greatly improved her coat, but she's still itchy. Anything else I can do? There are, first of all, um, I don't know how long you've had your dog on the food, but, um, you know, a while ago, l let's just say uh, until you tell me otherwise, if you're still watching us, that it's been a month. When dogs go on a raw diet, it's like humans going on a cleanse. They are kind of shocking their body from uh, moving away from the less healthy, less digestible foods into something that's going to purify their body and take out, take out the impurities in their system, help clean their liver, kidney, digestive tract. The starches that we've eaten in, or a dog has eaten, are still in their muscle tissue and they're working their way out. They're being replaced by healthy oils and healthy glycogen being produced from fat broken down into sugar and then being stored in muscle tissue. Uh, on a starch, that starch isn't broken down into a sugar, it ferments and it works its way into the muscle tissue as its way out of the body. So the muscle tissue stores that fermented starch as well as sugars. So as it's continuing to work its way out and it hits the skin layer or actually the layer right beneath it, in, in each hair that we have, in each hair follicle, there are mites and they are a cleaning crew. What they do is they eat and remove the impurities that are in the oil in the hair follicle and they allow, they allow that hair to take the benefits of the B vitamins uh, that was meant for it so that the hair can grow full and long. But those starches, when it gets to the surface and behind it comes all of this cleansing protein and fat that your dog is eating, it's, it's almost like a child that I'm cutting off from Happy Meals, right? I've been tapering them off for about a week and then I say, Okay, so now it's grilled chicken and asparagus. Sorry, but no more Happy Meals. They're gonna start to rebel. And that's what these mites in the hair follicles do. They start to rebel and they start looking for other sources of fermented starch. And unfortunately that happens to be in the muscle tissue. So below the epidermis, down into the dermal layer. So they're physically eating the starch that is in that muscle tissue. That will cause bumps to occur so your dog may get better and then these little bumps start to occur and people panic. They will call their vet, they will take their dog off the food and what really needs to happen is you need another week, you need 10 more days because when the mites realize that there's nothing else to eat they have a choice between either eat or starve and they begin that conversion of going from eating an unhealthy food to a healthy food and then the bumps will recede, the hair will start growing more fully, and you'll see the scratching going away. So uh, Donna, I hope that answers your question, and if not, uh, you can get back to us. Um, Amy, coming to us all from the East Coast, thank you very much for sharing the video. Lisa, hi, hope you're still with us. Joanne is always, Joanne um, Takushi is always sharing our videos and posts and talking to everybody about us. Um, Joanne, we love you. Thank you for doing that for us. Um, and then uh, Lisa Sarnay, she says, my boy has had allergies all 12 years of his life, allergic to everything, was even in meds. We have him on a raw food diet going on four months. Wow. 
off the meds and he's a puppy again. Good stuff. Um, so when I first started reading that, I, I thought this was going to be a how do I change over to raw food, but um, it's actually a, we've switched him and you know, going on four months and he's getting better and he's off the meds. That is very typical. We see dogs with severe health issues. Mange is uh, one of the ones that destroys me when I see a dog with it and that dog is in a high kill shelter. It is so simple to fix with even moderate nutrition. No medications are required and the dog being one of the best survivors on the planet can fix itself with a modicum of nutrition. So if I were to put a dog like that on a raw diet, and we do have an example that I'll post uh, a little bit later about a dog named Neptune. Neptune went from full-blown uh, open wound demodetic mange to a complete full hair supermodel looking purebred Airedale. She was adopted two weeks after that, I had to make her the last dog out of our feeding trials that were that was adopted, or we wouldn't have been able to fin finish with enough dogs. And um, I mean, I know some of this stuff is going to happen, but even when I see it happen, I'm I'm just still so absolutely amazed by it. So, Lisa, thank you very much for that comment, and and I'm happy uh, that your boy is doing well. Uh, we have Dakota that joined us. Uh, Nii Superat's on with us. Hey guys. Uh, Aloha Kama Kama. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Aaron uh, Kua. Some people call him hilarious. He he's um, he's a dog. He's uh, I love him to death, but. Um, I love him to death, uh, but yes, if you have food, he, he's your best nuisance and best friend, so he's, he, he loves this food. Uh, and we have Laura vying with us. Uh, Laura and her family are going to be moving uh, to Germany with the military. I think they're leaving at the, uh, the end uh, or sometime next week, so we're going to miss them uh, quite a bit. Justin Stevens wrote us a note. He said, I have a 22-pound dog and feed him two ounces per serving, and a 13-pound dog, one ounce per serving, as recommended. Is it recommended to feed them two times a day or feed him three times a day? Well, Justin, hopefully I answered that question for you. Um, honestly, your dog doesn't care. Now, my dog is not a representative example of um, it's okay, Dad, feed me twice a day. It's more of a I'm going to start uh, a low whimper, medium whimper, howl bark, just in full bark mode. He has me trained, so he will get fed uh, somewhere in that nuisance escalating process. But um, you can feed a dog whatever fits your schedule. If that's morning and night, that's fine. I only say it with a puppy or a pregnant or lactating female. You might want to space those uh, nutritional kind of injections those nutritional meals out because the phrase complete and balanced that we talked about means that it was formulated for puppies and pregnant or lactating females because they have the highest nutritional requirement of any age point or any condition in a dog. So you may see something in a store that says senior formula. There's no definition for that. Senior formula means it, they may not put complete and balanced on the front. You may think it was formulated for seniors, but really they can put anything they want in that bag. So I always look at for complete and balanced on the label. So I know that somebody did a nutritional analysis of that food. I know that food has everything in it that my dog wants and needs, and that I'm providing them a wholesome, nutritional full diet every single day without having to worry about it. Uh, and periodically we send our, off our foods to redo those nutritional analysis. And we may spot check. We may just look for vitamin content like when we've changed farms. Um, a farmer on the Big Island 
may have very different mineral and vitamin content in their vegetables than a farmer on Maui or a farmer on Oahu. So we want to pay attention to that because the conditions of, of their soil are very different. Uh, but thank you, Justin. That's a good question. Uh, Barbara, she says, I buy raw from you folks, beef and chicken, just not sure of the daily amount for my golden retriever. Female, two years, 55 pounds. Uh, do I give her anything else? Uh, great question. So she is... 55 pounds. What I recommend is that when you start feeding, you round up. So we know that uh, eight ounces or one cup, so that's the red one, one cup is for a 40 pound dog. And then I want to go another uh, 20 pounds to take it up to 60. And so I'm going to add another. I guess you can see that half cup. So it's going to be a cup and a half a day. How do I know I'm feeding my dog the right amount? And you have to look at their poop. Uh, when you look at a dog's stool, when they're going to the bathroom, if it comes out dry and crumbly, your dog isn't getting enough food. So that, that is indicative of a dog who is digesting everything that's in the food, and what's coming out is mineral content that does not have sufficient fat to hold it together. If your dog has large bowel movements, so they're brown or they're a darker color, uh, but it looks like the amount you were feeding when you were back on kibble, you're overfeeding. So you're going to back those amounts down, and I can't tell you an exact amount, but Look at the stool over a two or three day period and see how it changes. If you're going to take them on, you know, a 5K run, they're going to consume more calories than if you're just taken down to the beach, you know, to sit there for a couple hours. So like our nutritional requirements change, so will theirs. And their calorie burn per day will change. But the stool is the best indicator of how much food they need. Um, and if you need to add more, you just do it at their next meal. Uh, what other things can I add? I can add raw eggs. How do I do that? I, I take a whole egg and I can either crack it and throw the shell in with it or I can just take the whole egg and kind of shot put it in the bowl so it cracks or with my dog I just put an egg in the bowl. He knows exactly what it is. The shell is made of calcium. Um, it has some a little bit of phosphorus in it but mainly it's calcium. So you know calcium uh, a, a necessary amount is good for your dog, but just like anything, you, you feed in moderation. I don't want to give my dog, you know, a cup of calcium powder every day. That's just, you know, we, we know that that's uh, nutritionally uh, incorrect and undesirable to do. Um, I'm going to back up. Um, to, to finish Barbara's question, no, our, our feeds are complete and balanced. If uh, you want to give tripe, um, if your dog is slow, sluggish, your dog has other types of diseases that can benefit from a probiotic just like us, give your dog a probiotic. If your dog is sneezing or has, uh, you see that your dog is developing some sort of cold, probiotics are the answer. When you give a dog an antibiotic, and this is often the first line of treatment uh, from a vet and from a traditional doctor, for, for that matter. What they're doing is they're assuming that there is a harmful bacteria at play that's making us sick. So they give us a broad-spectrum antibiotic. An antibiotic kills bad bacteria, and it kills good bacteria. Probiotics are a good bacteria. So when I eat my yogurt... Uh, I have acidophilus uh, bifidus, and I have all of these other probiotics in it that will help my immune system fix the problem. I take an antibiotic, and the antibiotic kills it. So dogs being the most amazing self-healers on the planet, I want to pump them up with probiotics first and wait a day or two. Now, unless it's something obviously serious, like a spleen rupture or your dog looks like it's choking, your dog is going through food refusal. If a dog is, if 
a dog is refusing food, then you absolutely need to take your dog to the vet. Um, food refusal for a day, I don't worry about. Food refusal the second day, I start to get concerned. And if I try to give my dog a piece of cheese and he won't touch it, we're going straight to the vet because I know on his deathbed, he, he will want a piece of cheese. So uh, cheese, avocado, banana, you can include apple, just as long as you don't include the seeds. Uh, seeds in a highly acidic environment can turn into cyanide, potassium ferrocyanide, and it would take a lot. I mean, it would take you know, a good pound of apple seeds, but there's just no reason to fool with it. Cut the seeds out and give your dog the apple flesh. Um, you can add any of those additional coconut oil, fish oil, um, and you don't need to give that much. Just a little bit to add the flavor to it and pay attention to the stool. Uh, Steve Cromwell's with us. Hey, Steve. And he shared everything. Uh, Justin Stevens. Uh, testimony. Our 13-year-old dog was very sluggish and hard to walk prior to switching to Rock Hog Hawaii, but now he looks younger and is more active and boisterous as a puppy. Thanks for a great product. Justin, thank you. That's also something that I've heard, and I know that Dakota and Philip and uh, Virgil, my kitchen manager, all of us have heard it. I've got my puppy back again. My dog lived to be 17 years old. He was a black chow Sharpe, and people would confuse him for a two-year-old dog. And he was 15, 16, 17 years old. So if, if being on raw food can make somebody confuse an old dog for a puppy because of their energy and their looks, something's got to be right about it. And it's always worth exploring. But thank you, thank you Justin. I appreciate that. Um, Rama Chan asks, is uh, weight loss common when switching to raw food? Weight adjustment is common when switching to raw food. So let me explain. Dogs aren't meant to be rectangular. Dogs are um, considered, well, their shape should be tapered. If you think of a greyhound having a lot of muscle up front and in the chest and in the neck and having runner's legs in the back with uh, a defined stomach where you can see a rib or two, that's what a dog should look like. They will lose fat and they will gain muscle without having to go to the gym. I, I wish I was that lucky, as I'm sure many of you do too. But yeah, it, it's, it's going to be um, obvious that your dog's proportions are changing. But what you may think is weight loss is actually just a proportional change. You'll see really buff and cut muscles in, in their front quads. Their hind legs will look like sprinter's legs. Their neck will get a little bit larger. And it is so funny to see in a short-haired chihuahua when they start getting bulked out like um, you know a pit bull or something. And they think they're pretty badass before and, and now all of a sudden they got muscles so there's probably no living with them. But yeah, um, they can, but again, pay attention to the stool. You may need to provide more food as their muscle tissue grows. Um, Ronald, thanks for sharing our video. I appreciate that. And I think I have everybody's questions. So thank you very much from all of us at Raw Dog Hawaii. I appreciate you joining. If you have any questions about raw food, how to feed it, how to make it, what things maybe you should or should not put into it, feel free to give us a call. Also, um, things that you might be told by veterinarians, um, I don't, first of all, nobody goes into veterinary because they don't like animals and they're just in it to make money. That's, I couldn't believe that even if I found it to be true. But what I do know is that medical doctors and veterinarians receive very little nutritional training. Medical doctors, unless they take elective courses or alternative courses beyond 
their uh, medical classroom career take a three semester class in human nutrition. Veterinarians take a single semester hour class covering seven species. I, I have the book. And that may be a great course, but you're not going to learn nutrition about seven species in one semester hour. So they learn a lot of what they learn from their pharmaceutical companies and the dog food manufacturers. So I've had people tell me their dog went to a vet visit, blood work was great, vet said the dog was doing amazing, what are you doing? Oh, I'm feeding my dog raw. Oh, no, that's dangerous. You've got to get your dog off raw immediately. That's the logic I'm talking about, that leap, that question. It's like, well, so if raw is dangerous, if raw is going to kill me, why would I ever eat sushi? But why would it cause the condition of my dog to improve to a point that it impresses a veterinarian to then tell me that what I'm doing is dangerous. I, I've never found a good answer for that. And if you guys have and can share it with me, I would really, I'd love to hear that one because I, I just haven't gotten a good answer for it. Dr. Robin Woodley on the Big Island, I'd like to give a shout out to her. She's up in Kaba'a. Uh, she believes in both Eastern and Western medicine. She feeds her dog our raw food. They support it in the practice because she believes that food can be medicine. And she's the first one that I've met. And I got to, I had the pleasure of going to her practice and meeting Darnell and meeting Dr. Woodley and her staff and just amazing. So if you're on the Big Island, give her a shout out. Uh, she does carry her food and she'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, Robin says, I have a mini dachshund and he has a small waist, but the definition is as you described. Thank you so much. I, thank you. Uh, dachshunds shouldn't be dragging the ground. Basset hounds shouldn't be dragging the ground as low as they do. Uh, but any dog on a raw food is gonna shed unneeded fat because they're off the junk food. They're being fed basically what a weightlifter or an athlete would be eating, which is a high protein, moderate fat, low carbohydrate, low simple carbohydrate diet. So, well guys, thanks again. This, is, this has really been an honor for me. And just so I don't um, mess this up, uh, the Makai Pet Sitting and Mobile Grooming um, Salon, uh, Lita Lindholm, she is up at one o'clock. I encourage you to go over and listen to her presentation, and she'll be announcing the live video following hers. So thanks again. Aloha, and thanks for supporting Raw Dog Hawaii. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.